Chibaki's uh, sorry, NASA Space Flight Center as our speaker today. So Chibaki uh, did his uh, undergraduate in physics from the Exquire Presidency College, and then he did his uh, PhD from Ayuka in Pune. And when he do a postdoc in Prince uh, University in Belfast, and then University of California at San Diego, and then he joined NASA Goddard as a scientist. And uh, Chibashi's expertise is in mostly in extra emission from active galaxies. And uh, we were very glad to know that Chibashi got the uh, Goddard Exceptional Achievement in Science Award. Uh, the, that's one of the first Bengalis who got this award. Um, so uh, congratulations to Chibashi and let's uh, and uh, let's hear from him about new exciting uh, you know observations from Africa. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ritabonga. Thank you, Shrijatanadi, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. And it's uh, it gives me immense pleasure an honor to come back to my old uh, college, which is now a university, um, and talk to the fresh young minds, which I was once. I don't know what I am now. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, um, it, it's really um, a big honor for me to uh, stand on this podium um, in my alma mater and, uh, and uh, talk to the students. So today, my talk will be um, uh, mostly um, uh, divided into three phases. The first phase is, uh, I'll give you some examples. Of, uh, there are lots of things going on at NASA and I cannot cover all of these things. Um, there are a lot of things going on and uh, including the moon mission Artemis and you have seen uh, Great, exciting news from the ISRO moon mission as well. Um, and there is the solar park probe and uh, other missions. JWST is, of course, making news. So I cannot talk about all of these. But if you want to ask me uh, questions, I can talk about that later. Um, I'll give you some uh, brief glimpses of uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, observations by JWST in the last uh, couple of years. And then I will jump on to my research topic, which is black holes. Uh, I'll try to uh, explain what is black holes, and I know many of you actually know what is black holes and um, my my uh, work on black holes. And most interesting thing is that I want to talk about what I do as a mission support scientist. So at NASA, my main responsibility is to maintain a mission. So I I am responsible as as part of team. I'm responsible for SWIFT mission. SWIFT is a is a is a leading mission, X-ray UV mission by NASA, and um, I am the SWIFT bat scientist, and uh, to get up at night, uh, receive calls and uh, see what check the health of the uh, telescope. So that's what I would like to talk, and then end with uh, how can you make a career in astrophysics uh, in Indian abroad. Um, so most of you are aware of JWST. I don't have to introduce. Uh, it's um, it has been launched in 25th December 2021, um, and it, has, it is it is mostly infrared, a little bit of optical, but mostly infrared, and um, and it's 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 designed to have a huge collecting area. Um, the collecting area is almost uh, like uh, a few times uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, and um, this huge collecting area and it's a uh, nice uh, location in the L2 point, the Lagrange point, uh, makes it a very, very unique observatory to capture um, the, uh, the early universe, the early galaxies, the early supermassive black holes. And uh, James Webb Space Telescope is doing its <coughs> best. Uh, sorry if I, if I stop sometime because of um, my throat is. Uh, giving me trouble. Uh, so James Webb has been doing great, and I'm very fortunate that um, I'm also working with uh, Nobel laureate John Mather, who is also working at, uh, at NASA Goddard, and he's one of my mentors, and he was a project scientist, uh, the chief project scientist for JWST until last month, um, before someone else took over. 
So JWST is poised for big discoveries. It has already made big discoveries, which I'll share some of them, some of the uh, figures with you. But I just wanted to make uh, give you a feel why we need infrared because in infrared, uh, like all wavelengths have their own pros and cons. Uh, optical has uh, its own pros and cons. Like we can see uh, optical light because it's the atmosphere is um, transferring to optical light mostly. And uh, we can't see uh, infrared, we can't see uh, X rays, we can't see other bands. <clears throat> but these are also very valuable information from uh, outer space. So, infrared is something which can actually help you um, uh, see the stars that are being formed behind the dust. So, it's, it, this is an example of how an infrared telescope can actually help you see the hand behind the curtain. Uh, so, let me go jump into the beautiful pictures. So this is something, um, uh, a star forming, um, actively star forming a nebula. And uh, uh, you can see the stars being formed and, um, and the nebula is very active and rich with, uh, with high energy emissions. So uh, the reds are different colors are different wavelength bands. So these are all false colors. Most colors are false colors. Colors have definition only when you're talking about optical wavelength, there's nothing there's no color beyond optical. So whenever you see a color in infrared, color in X-ray, color in whatever band, it means it's false color, just to distinguish between and make it pretty. So this is a pretty picture. So it's uh, different wavelengths, different infrared bands. And um, this is a star forming region, for example. Another star forming region and nebula. Um, stars form in dense medium because to form a star, you know that you need the mass of that particular blob of cloud to be large enough to fall due to its own gravity. So stars are basically uh, blobs where uh, the self-gravity is dominated. And then when you collapse, um, the fusion process starts in and the thermal and the radiation pressure actually gives a balance <laughs> like the sun, for example. So these are the stellar nurseries where stars are being formed. Another interesting uh, result that uh, we found was uh, the presence of a supermassive black hole at very, very early time in the universe. Uh, normal telescopes, like the ground-based telescopes and other telescopes have, have gone up to like uh, up to this blue part. But you see this, uh, sorry, I have a pointer here. So this is, uh, So uh, you see this, uh, this is a supermassive black hole where we, uh, the Webb telescope has found detect detected just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And that's a, that's a massive discovery because you don't get, I mean, it's conceptually um, like uh, difficult to understand because you can't have such a massive black hole sitting right just after the Big Bang. How can it accrete so much of mass and become such a massive uh, structure? Um, we still don't understand how supermassive black holes form and grow. We still don't understand. We, we understand they accrete matter at some rate and at some point of time grow, but we find supermassive black holes at every point of time. Then what's the point? Like if they need time to grow, they should have formed later. How can you get it there? <coughs> similarly, um, sorry. Similarly, um, there are there are lots of other like this. Okay, so um, do you need the video? Just okay. They can see the slide. Okay, so this is another uh, nice picture of the Saturn um, in the near infrared <clears throat> band with uh, taken in June 25, 2023. And you see the Saturn's rings in a bright air in, in, in infrared. So these are all sun, sunlight reflected. Um, then again, this is the Einstein's ring. This, this is a distant galaxy which has been seen by James Webb, um, where you have a foreground galaxy, which is very massive, either galaxy or a galaxy cluster, uh, which is very massive. And you have a gravitational lens structure, you have lensing due to the, the foreground gravity. Uh, ga sorry, foreground galaxy. And you see this background galaxy in a more zoomed in uh, way. So you can not only see the galaxy, but also in a very zoomed in way. 
So gems were the seen um, gone into uh, looking further into the past. So this is these are never before images. I mean, you, could, you can't do these things with any other telescopes currently working. So this is one more interesting um, picture of uh, NASA's uh, Chandra and Webb combined. Chandra is extra mission where we have, um, you see the purple knots are like extra mission and the white um, and the purple combined are the high energy emission that is coming from, um, <clears throat> from the central Asia. This is M74, Messier 74, and you see this dust lanes that are formed in the infrared, which is very, very intricately detected by JWS. All of these dust lanes are filled with stellar nurseries and lots of stars are being formed here. So this picture is good, but if you are a real astronomer, what people do is study this small pixel and see what the stars are doing and how is it starting to form. So you can actually correlate between the density of this particular region with the star forming rate. So you know in a spiral arm how the stars form and where the stars form. form. And these are huge information in, in galaxy evolution theories and how we understand how um, how stars form in, in, in different types of galaxies. Um, this is the pillars of creation, of course. It's a very famous picture. You have seen it with HST, but uh, you have not seen such, uh, such clarity with, uh, with HST. So these are also stellar nebula, stellar nurseries, and uh, a huge amount of uh, star formation goes on here as well. And um, this is also called Eagle Nebula, and uh, and uh, there are lots of uh, star forming regions. And um, uh, I mean, from behind the scenes, so you can see a lot of things behind the scene that you could have seen in the HST. Because these are like curtains of dust. Another aspect, so I'm touching on different aspects. I mean, many of you know that all of these things are uh, extremely detailed things. So one, one slide may actually takes one talk. So pardon me if I'm just rushing through because I have to talk about black holes, but um, these are something which all of us should know that JWST is doing um, enormous amount of science and you all can participate in that. And uh, you, you just need to uh, contact the right person, get the right signs, and you have the right ideas. So this is like a, a the sun. This is a this is not the real image, of course, but the light curve is here. This is a star, and this is a planet that is revolving around it. And JWST has seen the light curve um, drop down when there is the starlight only, as compared to when this when this planet actually reflects the light on the day side. So you see this is starlight plus the planet on the day side. This is starlight only. And this is starlight plus the planet on the day side. So you know what is the emission from the planet surface due to reflection. And you can calculate the temperature of the planet surface from this particular um, light curve. And also you know whether it's a rocky planet or, or other types. So this is something never before again. This is uh, another uh, like wolf right star, which is a very bright star, which is going to become, hopefully become a supernova. But these type of stars also have a past history. And this history is shown in this dense molecular cloud that is that it has shed at different points of time. So this is the central star and it has shed different layers at different points of time. And this is also a very important point of study. Um, galactic get together. So these are type of these are the things which we still don't understand, like galaxies merging and galaxies. Uh, what happens when a galaxy passes by our Milky Way, for example? What will happen? It will strip open the spiral arms, and it will just take away uh, the different material. But in what way? What, what is the physics? So these type of galactic dances are observed in, in several cases, and uh, JWST actually uh, gets a good glimpse of these. Stefan's quintet is also a famous example of uh, quintet means five. There are four actual galaxies, and one of them is just in the background, I guess. 
So these galaxies are like in, in gravitational interaction with each other and they are like talking to each other. So, so this is also a very famous, um, famous uh, uh, source which uh, shows a lot of star formation and <clears throat> lot of um, lot of infrared emission. And uh, of course, again, this is this type of nebula. So I'm mostly like showing you infrared images because it's still WST, but sometimes there are like Hubble Space and Chandler images as well when we show the uh, when we show the uh, X-rays. But you see that this is actually a black curtain, and you still see the stars. You see, each of these are tiny, tiny stars that are being formed, either formed or they are already formed. So you can see these stars with JWST, which you could not have um, with any other telescope. So this is this is what JWST does, um, and not HST. HST wouldn't have just um, not observe any of these stars behind the curtain. And this is the deep field um, uh, lens galaxies. Uh, <clears throat> you see, this is the lens galaxy, which is like around 11 to 13 billion light, light years away. You see the lensing happening here due to this galaxy cluster. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed a little bit of uh, JWST games. Uh, all of these things are like again one of one slide each is one hour talk. So, um, so go back, go, go ahead and uh, take a look at um, the JWST website, and uh, I really urge you to like uh, contact. Uh, NASA guys, if you want to ask uh, more questions, if you have more questions, if you want to augment your science ideas, feel free to write to them. <laughs> now tell me, who have uh, not heard about black holes? Every one of you have heard about black holes. So that's a better question, not heard about black holes. So, um, so, how many of you have worked on black holes? Like, I'm just trying to gauge uh, students. Yeah, okay. So, some of you have not worked on black holes, but you know what is a black hole, right? <laughs> so, no, I'm asking you because I I need to understand like how um, how should I present myself? So, black holes are, of course. Um, the hot topic, and uh, it's, um, it's it's a direct um, uh, consequence of Einstein's field equations, um, which we studied in general relativity when I was doing my masters. So maybe some of the master students can uh, uh, can uh, understand what's what's real there. Uh, it's R R mu mu T mu mu T mu mu. Okay, and. <laughs> And there are lots of solutions to this equation in different different forms. Okay, so suppose you take a spherically symmetric object with no charge, no angular momentum, you end up with this Schwarzschild metric. It's a very simple solution, which is not physical, but it's a simple. Okay, fine. So Schwarzschild metric, you see all these singularities. Singularity means something with one divided by zero. So you see there is a singularity at i equals to pgm by c square. So Black hole is something which we still don't understand. It is full of singularities beyond, like below a certain radius, which is the event horizon. We don't understand what's going on inside. So we just have three properties, mass, charge, and angular momentum, or the spin. And these properties, they accrue over time. So suppose I throw you into a black hole, it will just be m plus small m1. And uh, it, if I throw all of us, then it will be just the simple addition. It's very simple. It's that M1 plus M2 plus M3. So it's very, very simple. So Einstein did a lot of detailed maths, but this portion he was very simple. Just throw mass, it just adds up. But it was not until the visionary calculation of Chandra Shekhar that we really appreciated black holes. So I just tell you a very brief story. Again, many of you know, but Chandrasekhar was the one who calculated um, using uh, both relativistic and quantum mechanical uh, calculations with with the with the uh, um, what do you call it? Um, how can how can a star be, become stable? What is the condition for stability of a star? 
and uh, we we write the equations like the uh, uh, phase relation as uh, the pressure is proportional to the density to the power alpha or something like this. Now he was the first to understand that if the star is more massive, it cannot stay put. It cannot be. It cannot hold itself. Why? Because there are two types of degeneracy pressures that come with. It. First is the thermal pressure, which is the main sequence stars, thermal and the radiation pressure, which is happening in the sun. That is very obvious, people know it fine. He came up with the idea that, okay, when the thermal and radiation pressure goes away, what happens? The, the gravity should act and it should fall in. So if it falls in, what will resist? So that time Eddington and all these big people said, no, nature is not a fool. Nature has some uh, mechanism by which it can resist things. Now, Chandrasekhar showed that at some mass, it will not be able to hold its, uh, beyond certain mass, it will not be. So the first um, problem is the electron degeneracy pressure. You know, in quantum mechanics, no two electrons stay, can stay in the same quantum state. Okay, so it means that if you bring in two electrons close enough, both physically and quantum mechanically, you need more energy to pump them inside. It's just spring acting in the opposite direction. So, so you need energy. So he, he theorized that white dwarf is a state. This is uh, Aki's conception of a white dwarf. White dwarf is a state where the electron degeneracy pressure acts on. And if the star is massive enough, then it, then the electrons combine with the nuclei to form neutrons. The protons and the electrons combine to form the neutrons, and it becomes a neutron star. What happens? The star is more massive. Then he said, "What if it just collapses to a gap?" So that was something, Chandrasekhar's vision actually, and no one accepted that. Remember. He resigned from Cambridge University, had to come to US at Chicago to get a job because no one um, actually accepted this idea because that time people told, no, 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 no. You cannot collapse a star just getting to singularity. No, no, no. Nature has some balance because everywhere you see equilibrium, right? So the black hole's concept was not there until 1930, 31. He first said that black hole. So that's what this famous Chandrasekhar mass limit, which is 1.41 something times n sun. That, so our sun will never become a black hole. That is the point. So, but it will become a red giant and then a white dwarf, but it will never become a black hole. So black holes got established. Yes, black holes are there. And then researchers found a lot of things. And then what happened in 1960s, people found that emission is happening from a very tiny region like the solar system, but the emission is so powerful. It is so powerful that it's, it's outshining the entire galaxy. There, there are like thousand billion stars in a galaxy. You are outshining the thousand billion galaxies in the star with an emission from a region of the size of the solar system. Can you think of People saw the dynamics of the motion of things and then they discovered no, there is, there are black holes and this, this should be black holes. So you can't see a black hole, but you can know the presence of a black hole through this. And now you can see a black hole. So this is the even for as telescope image. Again, I'm telling you, these are all one hour lectures. You have to really go into even for as telescope uh, pages and see how this is. This is a remarkable feat. I am telling you, no less than discovering the gravitational waves because they are resolving something. For example, I'll tell you, take an orange, orange, keep it on the surface of the moon, stand here and see. And if you can resolve the orange as an orange, you see this. Do you understand the amount of resolution it took? The interferometric um, uh, methods it took. If you keep the orange at residency, the main gate, you can't see the orange. Oh, pollution later on, but I'm telling you, literally, this is a marvelous feat, and you should appreciate this, and not only that, you should be a part of this. 
you should be a part of this. All of you should be a part of this. We, it's, a, it's a humanities uh, a step. So we are all a part of this. It's not just PhDs, all of us are doing it, right? We are all contributing in our own way. So an orange kept on the surface of a moon is something which they are seeing. This, this is the black hole. It's the distance of few megaparsecs. And you can see the black hole. <clears throat> so we are not seeing the black hole. This is the black hole shadow. This is the actual disk. So you're not seeing the black hole. We, we can't see a black hole. Now, people ask me, well, how are black holes formed? I, I, I've already gone into video four. I've not shown you videos one, two, and three. So let me let me get that. Um, I feel you're enjoying, right? Enjoying. Okay, so let me show you video one. You will appreciate more. So you want to visit a black hole. You've packed your bags, you've updated your passport, and you're basically ready to jump on a spaceship and blast off. However, before you do that, I have just one piece of advice. Don't. Okay. If you really must go, I suppose you should at least know a few things about black holes before you leave. First, you should know exactly what a black hole is. A black hole is a physical object in space, just like everything else. It's made up of a tiny but massive point where gravity and density are infinite, a line beyond which everything, including light, can only fall into that tiny point, and sometimes some glowing stuff orbiting around it, and maybe some radiation. So basically, here is kind of bad, here is really bad, and here is safe. Also, black holes mostly come in two sizes. Don't ask me why, we still aren't sure. However, a black hole is also not a lot of things. It is not a hole a cosmic vacuum here, a portal to another dimension populated by unicorns and space potatoes, and absolutely not a good place to vacation. Okay, fine. I guess next you'll need to know how to find a black hole. Though technically black holes could just sneak up behind you, they likely won't. The nearest known one is 3,000 light years away anyway. However, if you were to go looking for them, there are a couple of good ways to find them. First, black holes tend to mess with their environment, so you can sometimes use interesting clues, such as a bunch of stuff orbiting what appears to be nothing. And second, as we mentioned before, there's often glowing stuff orbiting around them, caused by, well, when things get too close. So now that you've found a black hole and really aren't listening to me saying not to go, it's time for a few important safety considerations. First of all, the good news is that as long as you stay far away, black holes aren't that bad. However, as you get closer, you need to keep a few things in mind. The radiation near the black hole can be extremely deadly, so the chances of escape get slimmer the closer you get. And if you get close enough, you now have to worry about being stretched into a giant noodle and time getting really weird. So, unless you have great radiation shields, aim faster than light spaceship, or you're completely indestructible, you should probably just stay away. Well, that pretty much sums up black holes, at least before things start getting really complicated. But before you go for real, please refer to the handy brochure on your spacesuit pocket, since there's quite a bit to remember. Now then, remember your tickets, enjoy your trip, and please be careful. So this is uh, two white dwarfs, uh, sorry, two neutron stars <clears throat> merging and um, and giving out gravitational waves. Let's see. These are all gravitational wave tails. Um, and as it comes closer, Frequency increases. It's very, very, very la large um, emission, and then you see a lot of gravitational wave, uh, and then the final uh, thing can either be a larger neutron star or a black hole depending on what's the, the companions so this is something which I'll, I'll i'll show in my talk and then i'll again come back <clears throat> 
So let me go ahead. So how are black holes formed? There's a big question we still don't understand fully. The straight answer is that there could be a massive star which falls, uh, which collapses due to its own gravity, as I told you, it just collapses and it forms a black hole if it's massive enough, like 20 times the mass of the sun or more, and it just collapses because it's all run out of fuel. Um, what is the fuel of a star? Can anyone tell me? Uh, when I say star runs out of fuel, what is the fuel? Is it British petroleum? Yes, hydrogen to helium minus alpha process, perfect. And there are higher processes there, right? but mostly hydrogen to helium. <clears throat> so when this happens and when it just stops, it, it, it just uh, can't hold its gravitational uh, um, um, force. Another way to form larger black holes is to merge it. So uh, different black holes merge and it forms a black holes. And, uh, uh, we know that many, uh, many such massive black holes are formed with time when merging black holes, uh, different things. Now, this is one of the landmark results, landmark figures in the history of astrophysics. And you should all know this, that's the reason why. So this is the light curve from Fermi, and uh, uh, this is the light curve from Fermi telescope. Another telescope, which uh, NASA's telescope, so um, and uh, it's a hard, hard extra telescope. You see, there is a blip here, which far be detected as a GRB. GRB is a gamma ray burst, and this is the LIGO Virgo chart map. Chart means you detect a gravitational wave. So there is a gravitational wave detection which went up, sweep, and then almost 1.7 seconds later there was a GRB detected by Fermi. So this is the first ever detection of a neutron star, neutron star merger, and a corresponding GRB and the gravitational wave. This is one of the most important figures of astrophysics, which happened in 2017. So the GRB's name is 170A, and uh, the gravitational um, uh, with uh, the event is uh, named, uh, I don't remember the name, the same similar name. So, <clears throat> this is the first time we could really prove that multi messenger astronomy actually is important for us to understand what's going on in the universe. This is gravitational wave, this is not something electromagnetic. Historically, we have always used electromagnetic spectrum for, um, for uh, our astrophysics. But this is gravitational wave, entirely different. Another way uh, we use is the neutrino uh, detections from, from lasers, for example. But you should remember this figure. You shouldn't forget. This is one of the most important. Uh, so this is, you see, sorry. This is merger uh, event happening here. It's the vertical line. So the two things merge. And it takes 1.7 seconds lag for the emission to become like um, uh, bright enough as GRB. Now, can black holes evaporate? That's a big question. The straight answer is uh, we have not yet uh, uh, proved it. But uh, Stephen Hawking uh, has a theory. Uh, is that um, vacuum is not actually a vacuum. It's like particles are being constantly being produced, particle, antiparticle, and some antiparticles near the event horizon can get in, and the particles with um, energy from the black hole can actually go out. So in a, in, inherently that the black holes can actually be, um, the energy from the black hole can actually be uh, taken out and the black holes um, just evaporate. Larger the black holes, more time they take. Tiny the black holes, less time they take. That's why in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, the black holes were formed, <laughs> they lived microseconds, like they just barely lived. So, so, they, so people in the newspapers used to write, black holes will be formed and they will just eat us. Yeah, they, these are large vacuum cleaners, they'll just eat us. One thing you should understand, black holes have a very, 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 very tiny cross-section given their mass. 
it is the most compact object in the universe. So it cannot just uh, go and vacuum clean everything. I'll come back to that later. So how black holes um, eat stuff, like how they actually accrete matter. Black holes accrete matter through a process called accretion. Why black hole accretes matter and not just like eat matter, just you throw a stone in a pond, it just goes in. Can anyone answer this question? Angular momentum is a very good, good guess, good answer, but what is exactly going on? Oh, yeah. Those are very heavy words. I am very novice, that's so why I, I like very, uh, very down to earth answers. Can, can someone? Okay, very, very, very easy answer. The answer is, if you convert this earth to a black hole, the size will be a coin. Take a two rupee coin or one rupee coin, earth, earth will be converted to a black hole. Now, if you're sitting on the moon and throwing a stone on this earth, will it strike the earth, the two rupee coin? What is the probability it will be reduced by 10 to the minus some 20 factor, right? Because it's so tiny cross section, of course. So what will happen eventually to be captured in the orbit? Now his answer comes in. If it is captured in the orbit, it will go on eternally like that because Keplerian orbits are stable. So it has to lose angular momentum to fall. How does this happen? Because if there are many particles, many particles that are falling in, due to self-gravity, they become uh, thin. We call them Bengali chile chapter. It becomes thin and it becomes flat because of self-gravity. And that self-gravity helps also in some way, we still don't understand how this particular flat structure uses angular momentum and falls in. So you have to use angular momentum to go to one step in, one step in. So there are mechanisms, magnetic fields and other mechanisms discuss uh, at text, but the basic answer is that black holes have a very, 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 very tiny cross section. It cannot just be throw matter black hole, it will get into black hole, no, never. It will, if you are very lucky, like you are like luckiest person or not, it will maybe go, but the, you can calculate the cross section, which is uh, like, uh, it goes as a radius minus two, so radius itself is so small. So what happens is black hole actually eats matter. So this is a binary, um, uh, this is a black hole, which is stellar mass black hole. This is a big star, and it is pumping in matter from the star. So the gravitational effect of the black hole also extends to the star. That's why it is a binary system. But it is not eating matter directly from the star. It is not gulping it. What it is doing is pulling in little bit matter and it's getting it like this. So, so that's how black holes grow. And that's how black holes eject emission of jets as well. Now, supermassive black holes are different class. Supermassive black holes, this is also an artist impression. So supermassive black holes are like real giants. I'll show you a video. This is video three. You can see the size comparison between two black holes. Um, yes, this one. Supermassive black holes have a typical size of 10 to the power six or more mass of the sun. So it's huge, and you just see the size of black holes.
I just want to pause here and say, look, all of these are galaxy names, but these are not galaxies. These are the supermassive black holes sitting at the center of the galaxies. Now, this is a supermassive black hole. For example, a black hole that I study, I'll show you. So the size of the black hole and its event horizon is almost of the size of the solar spectrum. Now I told you just at the beginning of my talk, the black holes emit, the black holes don't emit, but the accretion disk emits so much of light from this tiny region. This is tiny, I mean, compared to solar system, we are tiny. But solar system is tiny compared to this massive black hole. So this is the size of the black hole. And it is emitting so much of, uh, the accretion disk emitting so much of light that it's outshining the host galaxy with billions of stars. Okay, I'll come take this one. Don 6 1 is the largest known black hole. 10 to the 10? 10, 10 billion? Okay. So, where were we? Okay. So, now we have uh, uh, like an estimate of what the black hole sizes are. So, fine. So, let's move on to the next phase, which is the active galaxies. Galaxies which are active are very bright at the center. Milky Way is not an active galaxy. You see this very bright center? It means that the emission from here outshines the whole galaxy. So the black hole is eating matter so fast, so fast, that it is shining out a lot. So these type of galaxies are called active galaxies, and these are the hotbed of research right now. Many of us are doing our research on these active galaxies because we cannot produce these effects, these, these conditions in laboratory. You cannot have a gravitational field of a black hole, massive black hole in laboratory, right? This is not a rat that you can inject something and then see the next day what is happening. I'm not, I'm not um, telling they are, I'm just telling this is not lab defined science. Astrophysics is not a laboratory science. It, 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 there are aspects of it where which we do laboratory, like emission lines, absorption, blah, blah, but it is entirely an observation driven science. What we observe is this. Now we have to interpret <clears throat> from this. Now I'm going to a little bit of technical part of this particular talk because um, I know some of them, some of you are like, you know what, what active galaxies, what these are. So there are big questions in astrophysics right now. So how much time do we have? 10 minutes? 15, 20 minutes, okay. 15 minutes, okay. So there are many big questions in astrophysics. First of all, we have to understand that we know very little. Um, especially I'm talking to like MSc and BSc students when you say this should happen, that should happen. No, when something happens, we have to try to explain why this has happened. This. Keep an open mind. Only then you can proceed, otherwise not. So for example, there is a very tight relation between the mass of the central mass of the black hole in case of galaxies and the sigma, that is the distribution of <coughs> the stellar velocity in the bulge. That is here, the mass of the black hole and the stellar velocity distribution. And the stellar velocity distribution comes from like large distance, like it can be below power six, very large. Black holes, gravitational effect is very tiny and in a very small region. How come that black hole talks to those stars at such large distances and in a very uniform way? We don't know. That means there needs to be a language. I'm speaking in English. If I speak in Bengali, some of you will understand, some not. If I speak in Kannari, no one will understand, hopefully, because no one is from Kannara. If I speak in Arabic, no one will understand because these are the languages by which we communicate. So some languages we black holes must have developed 
to communicate with that. And the language can only be in terms of physics. There is energy, mass, momentum, etc. So all these, all these type of languages or different aspects of the same language needs to be acting coherently in all types of galaxies. So there must be some basic physics underlying it in which the black hole talks to the host galaxy. And again, like there are like different um, <clears throat> Different other questions, like for example, the cooling flow problem uh, in the intercluster medium, uh, where you have galaxy clusters which are very hot, very hot galaxy clusters which should cool down. If you see the cooling rate, it should cool down a million of million years. But there are galaxy clusters which have been there for billions of years, not cooled at all. So, what's the point? What is supplying energy there? So, again, it comes back to energy. Then there is the feasible to baryonic mass ratio. What is the number amount of baryonic? We are all made of baryons, right? We are all made of <coughs> elements. So, what is the visible baryonic mass ratio? Do we see all the baryons sitting out there? No, we don't see. Theory says it should be twenty percent. Observe this twenty percent. So that's called a missing baryon problem. We still don't. See. That means it should be so hot that it's not emitting or doing anything. So all of these big problems are somehow related to the fact that AGN, the active galactic nuclear AGN, is a language. When black holes become too much hungry, they eat a lot, they throw out a lot. That is something which we believe happens and we have seen that to happen. So my talk, so I have worked in these fields um, quite a few years now. I'll, I'll briefly show you some, some results. You don't have to understand, don't have to like um, panic when you see, see a momentum versus energy or some plot, but just keep in mind that these are something which we actually do. So this is again a schematic diagram of, um, of, a, of a supermassive black hole with an accretion disk with lots of outflows that are coming up. So all of these outflows have different nature. So these are, X-ray outflows, these are UV outflows, these are <coughs> these are uh, optical outflows. And all of these outflows have their own role to play. These are different languages. I was talking of black hole languages, so these are different languages. So like in human society, all languages have their own role to play. These are also different languages by these black, black holes. So for example, in, in the large scale, these optical outflows actually transfer matter mass. In case of ultrafast outflows, which have been expressed, they transfer a lot of energy and they move away. Sorry, remove a lot of mass out of the things. And how do you study that? You study that using absorption spectroscopy. So, what is absorption? Suppose I keep this bottle in front of my eyes. Do you see the slide clearly? No, there is some distortion, there is some absorption, there is some something going on because it's an intervening medium. Similarly, black holes have the intervening medium in, from, from the black hole and our eyes because they're throwing off matter. How do you know those matters about studying those matters are through these absorption features. So for practicing as astronomers like us, these are the most beautiful things that can happen on Earth. For you, these are some sticks, and some, some something, right? Oh, so what is this, some bird walked around this place? Something like this. Oh, why don't you uh, hold it upside down? That would become a vision, right? So, so something like that. But truly speaking, these are some of the most beautiful uh, uh, things that uh, we have uh, known for the last few, few decades. And all of these absorption features that you see here are from the, uh, from different telescopes um, of uh, NASA and NASA. So again, like I was showing that was a different type of absorption. Here are also different types of absorption where you see like um, the absorption features shift with time. So shifting rings, suppose a cloud on the sky. Do you see a cloud standing right there for 10 years? No, not even 10 minutes, right? The clouds move. 
sometimes the clouds become more thin. So that is the thing that happens, like it moves around. And when you see the same source in a different snapshot, you see the absorption features have changed. So these are different, these give us different information about how the changes are happening, when they are happening, what is the mass and the momentum that we are calculating for these clouds. And this is something like we think is happening from the supermassive black hole, which is very tiny, is an accretion disk, and huge gusts of winds coming out. And all of these winds are pushing matter away. And black hole is quenching itself, like this black hole is eating vigorously, but it is stopping its. At some point of time, there is a regulatory thing in, um, in, 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 in uh, physics. Uh, there is always uh, a balance, like it, it, something cannot go on eternally, right? So black hole eating also stops at some point because black hole ejects a lot of matter and that matter is, is throwing away particles out and, and hence it simply cannot uh, um, eat uh, for a long time. So what is the conclusion on this is that black hole feedback is very important. The energies, the jets, this is the jet. These are the winds that are coming up. This is very important for us to understand how the black holes and the galaxies evolve. And why do we need to understand? Because we need to understand who we are and <laughs> from where have we come. So all boils down to philosophy. So these are the very fundamental uh, questions that we want to ask. Now, I've been talking about how black holes interact with the host galaxy. Now, how the host galaxy interacts with the black hole, we need to understand. You know how black hole is swaying our matter, but how the black hole is eating matter, we don't know. In most cases, we are seeing that their black holes are shrouded with dense clouds. Now, how, what is dense clouds? Where are they, do they come from? We don't know. And these are called torus. And these clouds are a part of the mechanism by which the black holes eat uh, matter through the accretion disk. And again, the spectrum. The spectrum that we see is that there is a very large absorption like this. This is an absorption spectrum which we see and we know the presence of this type of clouds through this absorption spectrum. And when this absorption um, column density moves, that is the absorption amount moves around, we know that the cloud is moving and we know that the cloud is moving and doing something here and feeding the black hole. So black hole feeding is also very important. So that's what I have studied. And you see these things are moving. So moving at a time scale of months to years, so it means black hole is doing something. We don't, this is not a direct evidence of black hole eating, but this is a direct evidence of matter moving around near the black hole. So possibly black hole is eating through this. I won't go into any details of these, but these are something. So this is also a schematic of how this happens. Now the final part, I have just five minutes left. So the cases of changing location, this is the most uh, recent and most uh, fascinating time during science uh, questions that have uh, come up. And changing locations are something which is like, uh, to put it in a very, very, very straightforward term is that sudden hunger of black holes, like the black holes becomes hunger, hungry suddenly, like within a few months, it accretes matter like very, 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 very fast and it gives a huge amount of luminosity, 10 times, 100 times more than what it used to get. Then gradually falls, 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 falls. And this is something which we studied and uh, it, and we studied something which, um, which, which is more interesting because we found that the we found that this eating of matter is also related to the vanishing of the corona. And the vanishing of the corona can only happen if we are really doing uh, with, with the magnetic field. There is something called corona which is sitting there. Sun also has a corona, but that's a different corona. AGM accretion disk has a corona which emits in x rays So these are X-ray coronas. But these are held at this place using the magnetic field, which 
threads through the accretion disk. When this magnetic field vanishes, the corona vanishes, but it the magnetic field again recovers because of some reason the corona gets recovered. And this was a very important paper that uh, uh, we published last year, and um, and uh, we had a very nice figure like this. And I just want to show you the video so that you'll understand everything through the video. Um, yes. This is this was prepared by the NASA Goddard for the our press release. So we had a press release, former press release last year, May, and this was prepared as a part of the press release. At the end of 2017, a galaxy 236 million light years away began a rare and dramatic transformation. It's an event astronomers are still puzzling over, one set off by changes near its central black hole. They first explained this as a tidal disruption event. That's when a star wanders so close to a supermassive black hole that it's torn apart. A new step. This is a tidal disruption event where you have a star being spread, spread apart when it comes near a black hole. But we think it's not a tidal disruption event. Observations spanning the entire event suggest a different cause. The trigger may have been a flip in the magnetic field in the disk of material around the black hole. The sun's magnetic field reverses polarity every 11 years. On longer time scales, even Earth's magnetic field flips. Starting in December 2017, the galaxy began to brighten in visible and ultraviolet light. The source of this brightening appeared to be the disk of material around the supermassive black hole at the galaxy's center. It peaked three months later at nearly 100 times its previous brightness. That's when regular monitoring with NASA's SWIFT satellite began. As the visible and UV brightened, X-rays from the galaxy dimmed. By August 2018, the higher energy X-rays had disappeared completely. A few months later, the high energy X-rays came back even brighter than before. They returned to normal within a year. These X-rays come from a cloud of super hot particles near the black hole. It's a feature called the corona, which is formed by the strong magnetic field. The lack of higher energy X-rays means that this structure was essentially gone. Based on observations from SWIFT, Europe's XMM satellite, and ground-based optical and radio telescopes, here's what may have happened. The visible and UV flare results when the flow of matter into the black hole increases. This may have started when the magnetic field in the disk's outer regions began to flip. The weakened magnetic field can no longer support the corona, which vanishes. The flipped magnetic field gains strength, restoring the X-ray corona, but the inward flow of matter is still high, so this emission is stronger than it was before the flare. Finally, the corona and disk return to their states before the flare, now with a flipped magnetic field. Rapid changes in UV and visible light have only been observed in a few dozen active galaxies like this one. But this is the first time X-rays have been seen to drop out as other wavelengths brighten. These surprising events offer a tantalizing glimpse at the extreme forces at work near an actively feeding supermassive black hole. Okay, so um, so you all all know what this figure is. So I don't want to explain. So all of you have uh, understood. So just to briefly tell you that this is the UV light curve. It's falls in like this, and you see the X-rays are vanishing. The triangle up on the list at the point X-rays are vanishing. This is called the light curve. The day is starting from some some day. And it vanishes, it goes up and down, and the UV light curve is falling normally. 
the radio is going up. So all of these things point out to a very, very, very enigmatic stuff. And um, yes, and I was uh, given this award uh, this year for my uh, for this uh, discovery. And also this is uh, at my NASA office uh, with uh, John Mather. Uh, so this he's a Nobel laureate. He received Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. He's uh, my mentor as well. And uh, um, it's, it's fun to work with him. And this is uh, this picture I couldn't resist giving because this is the building 29 of NASA Goddard where uh, big uh, telescopes are being built. So this is uh, inside uh, 29 where Roman telescope is now being built. Um, and this is where JWST was built. So when I arrived, I saw JWST. Now it's the space of Roman. Roman. So this is the clean room. You see, this is a huge building. The height is huge. And um, and uh, and this, you, ca you can't get in because it's a clean room. Um, this is the very last part. It's uh, what I do as a national NASA mission support scientist. This is a very interesting thing. Uh, people ask me as to do you have wake up all night? Yes. Answer is uh, brief answer is yes. So I have many duties as a mission support scientist. Is that first of all I have to um, I have to I'm responsible for mission health. So I'm responsible for this mission's swift mission's uh, BAT instrument. So BAT is the coded mass capture, which is hard X-ray instrument, and there are two other instruments called the UWAT and the XRT. So I'm responsible as a part of a team. So there's this tiny team of two people. And uh, um, whenever there is a flare or some problems, and we have thousands of problems, you know, like you can't go there and fix it. So you have to read the data. You have to understand what's going on on the ground and send commands. So I work with the Mission Operations Center. I think this is the Hubble Space Telescope Mission Operations, but we have a smaller version, maybe like one, one fourth of it. Uh, in Penn State, uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, mission operations where we actually, I don't uh, send the commands, uh, the engineers send the commands. And the most important problem that we have is the South Atlantic anomaly where we have a, um, a large concentration of uh, charged particles and, and SWIFT has a lower orbit and it goes through um, and this this part almost eight to nine times a day, and it, every time there's switch off, switch on. Everything is automated, but sometimes it creates problems that it's stuck in the same mode, or there are counts that are not coming down. Then there is, it's just like a baby, and it has to know the which tablets to give, and yeah, and trying to become a doctor, another doctor. And uh, another thing is like uh, mission health, uh, mission uh, bad GRB. So bad is uh, the swift bad is mainly focused towards GRB. That's the gamma ray burst uh, happening in, in, in cosmos, the extragalactic gamma ray burst. And gamma ray burst has nothing but like very large supernova, sometimes collapses. There's neutron star neutron star mergers that's happening. And there is a very, very strong hard X ray flare. And sometimes very tiny, but BAT actually detects them whenever because BAT has one sixth of the field of view or one sixth of the sky. So it is doing like this. Something happens, it detects and it stops. It doesn't move. What it does, it tries to locate where it is happening in the field of view and it tries to move its center where the other telescopes are to that particular point. And all of these things happen in just a few seconds just a few seconds on board, automated completely. That's the marvel. And something, the light curve looks like this. Very boring, but very interesting if you know it, what it is. So uh, these are, you see the different bands that observes in 50 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 100 and different energy bands. And if you see the light curves are different for different energy bands, it means uh, the light curve is more soft than hard. And we study these light curves and see what type of GRB is happening. And it can happen in the middle of the night. Get up, put that uh, laptop on, check the GRB. If it is a GRB, get, get the notice out to the community right then. So we have duties. 
um, every like every month we share the duties as to who the bad scientists for the GRBs. Anyway, that's about the job. <laughs> uh, no, I know that. <laughs> if if there was a GRB right now, it would have been based on my mobile, and I have to start the stop the talk and I have to, um, have to attend to that. And that's something I want to share with you. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Okay, question. Um, okay, so, so one of the questions I was thinking about uh, that magnetic flux inverse and that. Uh, we can talk about that later. Yeah, because that's a bit more technical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, lens is very easy because lens you see multiple images of the same source, same source, the same source you see multiple images and you have a diff different pattern, yeah, exactly. By same, I mean the emission spectrum and everything is same. So you know that this is a lens galaxy. The image pattern is also circular, but also the same source. You cannot have a spread of a source which is like, you can't have a galaxy which is more than a galaxy cluster size, right? So it, it is a galaxy of the same same source, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is a very powerful technique. Yes. Yes, Okay, the, the straight question. Do you mind using this so that I could keep the question to the. Okay, the straight answer is um, the black holes tend to be at the gravitational center of the galaxy. Now, why it is, it's obvious because it's the gravitational center, so the black hole is very tiny, compact, or just wherever it is, it has gradually 